All right, so we'll get started. Um, my name is Michelle, and I'm super thrilled today to speak to you guys about how to craft a breakthrough brand strategy. Looks like my screen is working. Um, so today, um, hopefully you guys are all interested in that brand space. It's a space that I've worked in for a long time. And, you know, brand strategy is something that has many different definitions. Um, and so we'll get into a bit of that today. Um, but I want to focus first on some of the benefits of a great brand. A lot of people, you know, when they hear brand strategy, they think about creative and different ads, but really a great brand is a business strategy that allows you to create a moat and kind of have a competitive differentiation against other companies in your same area. So some of the benefits, it lowers your marketing costs. It helps you inspire better ideas. It also lets you launch new products because people already trust your brand. You drive higher customer loyalty, charge higher prices attract better talent. Uh, talent acquisition is very expensive. So having people come directly from you is fantastic. Um, and finally, it helps you align kind of your whole team and company around similar ideas. So if you have a really strong brand idea, different teams from communications to product, to customer service, operations, they all kind of have an idea of the values of your company and can execute on them. So that even if another company comes in, they're trying to disrupt your business, you guys are already operating in a way that's very organized and it actually makes it very difficult for people to come in. And so today we're gonna to talk about how do you build that clear brand idea? Um, a quick one about me. Um, I see a lot of people already operating in the chat. Feel free to use the Q&A box and we'll put in questions uh, at the end. I've been working in the brand space for about 15 years, both on client side, agency side, and for a lot of different startup and large brands. And I've been writing on Medium for about seven, eight years now, which is wild. And I'm super grateful just for the Medium platform. It actually allowed me to quit a job in the past and go completely freelance and start my own brand consulting business. And so at the end, if you have questions about brand, as well as writing on Medium and how to turn that into a business, I'm happy to talk about either. Um, but we'll get started in the brand space. Uh, so as I said, brand strategy is something that has a lot of different definitions. So today we're going to focus on positioning. And a positioning is kind of who you are, what you stand for, and who you're targeting. And often when people talk about positioning, they use what's called a perceptual map. That's what's on the screen. And it's typically a two-by-two two matrix where, you know, you take different attributes on the market, you know, high quality or low priced, and you kind of figure out, okay, here's where all the competitors are. And this is this white space that we're going to operate in. And what I like about a perceptual map is they're easy to understand. Um, they also let you segment a multi-product portfolio to kind of capture different parts of the market. So for example, at Procter & Gamble, they have Tide, which is for effectiveness and getting rid of stains. And they say, okay, and then we're going to market gain for customers who really care about the attribute of scent and having really good smelling laundry. The other thing is that perceptual maps are kind of just fun to look at. You see where everyone is and you think about where you can go. The tough thing is if you have a perceptual map, it's only gonna offer a positioning that fits within the category dimensions that are already defined. And if you think about some of the really great brands that exist today and have come out in the past 10 to 15 years, when they came out, they didn't come in saying, oh, we're gonna fit into this category that already exists. Rather, they own something completely unique on the market. And that doesn't really happen in a 2D map. And really what great brands do is they define their own category. And I realized this when I was working with a client last year, they were a business in a really crowded space, but they offered something completely new. And I was trying with the CEO, we're trying to map, okay, here's where they are, here's the way they wanna go. And we realized it didn't really fit in their two by two. And by actually trying to plot it in a two by two, it was actually super limiting to their company. And we needed a completely new framework to show this company was doing something that nobody else was. And so we shifted from a two by two, you know, saying, okay, they're high quality and low priced, we're going to be both to a two by nothing. And a two by nothing, I know it sounds kind of funny. The idea there is that we're taking all your competitors and saying, actually, your competitors might seem different. They're actually all the same on this one dimension. And we're completely new on this other one. And so it's easiest to understand with an example. Um, and so I thought I'd use Airbnb because Airbnb is one of those companies, um, everyone knows what it is. And um, 
yeah, they're just a fun brand and they've really executed this super well. And so you think about Airbnb, they operate in the travel uh, space. And so if you were to map out the companies in travel, some of the dimensions you might use would think about luxury and affordability. You know, you've got a brand like Amon that really owns super, super high luxury space. Also leisure and business companies like Courtyard, they're going for this, you know, business traveler, road warrior type versus other companies like Carnival are really about leisure and family travel. And if you were to choose Airbnb, they'd probably um, be somewhere on the left side in the leisure space, you know, maybe not full luxury, but ne definitely not super affordable all the time, although Airbnb has a lot of options. The issue is, while well, it's super easy to kind of plot where Airbnb is, I'm sure if I asked everyone on this call to plot them, um, you'd be able to put them in a similar location. It doesn't then tell you, oh, here's how to come out with a really great ad for Airbnb or a great product extension. It's kind of flat. And so instead, um, oh yeah, and this is what I meant to say is, you know, it doesn't differentiate the brand, inspire creative or inspire product innovation. Instead, if you plot Airbnb using the two by nothing, you come up with this statement around every other brand, which is every other hotel brand, whether it's Amon to Carnival, which are very different companies, they all kind of do something similar, which is they're all really designed for tourists. You know, all these hotel rooms, they're the same around the world. So you're visiting a place. What makes Airbnb different is that you're experiencing it like a local. It's completely new on the market. And when you plot it this way, suddenly the different ads you can come out with, the different product innovations are very clear. Uh, so one of my favorite ads that Airbnb launched after this positioning uh, was this, you know, very probably inexpensive ad to produce of people going to a house and learning to make pasta on their own. And I love the Italian music. You know, it kind of says, I'm not just going to Italy or some place in the world to see the tourist destinations. I'm going here to be Italian. Something else Airbnb did after this is they launched their experiences category. And what's cool is that after launching their, you know, live somewhere like a local brand strategy, they were able to launch this underneath a larger umbrella that differentiated experiences. There are a lot of different travel platforms online where you can buy, you know, different activities. But suddenly the Airbnb one, even if it's similar activities, these are different because this is localized. This is those unique experiences. And you trust Airbnb and you trust this product extension. Uh, a different example I want to talk about is Crocs. Um, Airbnb is an easy one also because they were a product innovation. So it's like, okay, it's easy for them. There's something new. What if I already have a brand? How do I make my brand different? And what I like with Crocs is they did that also super well. Um, so if you map out the shoe market, it might look something like this. You've got your performance brands, such as Nike. You've got some brands that care a lot about fashion, other ones that care about comfort. Crocs was, sparely, was uh, squarely in that comfort space. You see that in their ads. This is one of their old TV ads where someone gets home and their Croc shoes literally massage their feet because they've been wearing uncomfortable shoes all day. Uh, other ads, you know, they were even creating shoes that were more quote unquote normal. Um, but they were like, you know, but we've got this Crocs technology inside. So it's really nice to your feet. About eight years ago, they decided to rebrand and not just own this functional comfort space, but shift to a more emotional and really different space called Come As You Are. And with this, they wanted to be completely new on the market and offer something different. And so what they noticed when they looked at everyone else in the market from Nike to Golden Goose and Common Projects is that all these shoes just, they look like shoes. And what might seem like a negative that Crocs are kind of kind of ugly, <laughs> kind of different, is that actually we're going to own that and we're going to make our whole brand about celebrating that individuality. And so they started putting ads like this one on the left, you know, really owning who they are. Tagline, ugly can be beautiful, very bold. And they made their larger brand tagline, come as you are. And if you see this, you know, the ad wasn't about blending in or being comfortable. It was really about standing out, being different, being the person at the center of the dance floor. They started including their own employees in ads and they redesigned their products. So instead of just saying, okay, how do we take what we have and let's blend it into what already exists on the market? They said, let's do something and show how different we are to everyone else, even if no one would ever wear this. 
Um, they then started getting weirder and weirder designs. They partnered with a lot of interesting collaborations. You know, before Crocs, there weren't a lot of brands doing collabs with like a Pop-Tart or ranch dressing brand, but they started doing that. Now you see other streetwear brands doing this kind of thing, but they really did it first. And they hired uh, this really famous designer, Salehi Bembury, to redesign their foam clog. Again, not to look like a typical shoe, but to be even weirder. Uh, these did so well, it really caught fire in the streetwear community to the fact that almost all of these are consistently sold out. And now they're working with Salehi Bembury on this really interesting sneaker concept that's also, it's not like they're trying to hide who Crocs is. They're really taking this and putting it on sneakers and being like, this is the most different sneaker you'd ever have. And so while it's a great story, it's like, okay, now I've got my brand. How do I actually execute this kind of thing? Uh, and so the first step is actually remarkably similar to what you might do if you have a perceptual map. You want to map out what's happening in the category. Who are the top brands? What are they kind of selling in their ads? What are the key attributes that you might put in a two by two? And how do brands perform along these metrics? The second thing is about understanding your brand. So, you know, what makes your brand different? What are your key values? This is really an excavation strategy. And um, for this, even if you haven't fully, you know, operationalized what makes your brand different, you know, for, for Crocs, they didn't, they were still in the comfort space. They didn't have ads saying that you're super different. But if you talk to employees and you said, what makes this different? What would an outsider say about your brand? You would start to get a sense that this is a different shoe. And um, some of the questions I like to ask in this space are really getting to the values of your company, because this is stuff that you kind of have internally, but you haven't really pulled out yet. One of my favorites, how would your brand act, act at a party? So you say, you know, I'm hosting a house party and the people there are Nike, Adidas, Golden Goose, Ugg, and Crocs. Who's doing what? Who's on the dance floor? Who's at the bar? Who's talking to people? Who's avoiding everyone? And that'll start to give a sense of, okay, what's the personality of this brand and what's different about it? Three is the hardest step. Um, and this is where you, what you want to do is kind of come up with what's that statement that takes every competitor you spoke about and puts them in one box and shows that you're completely different. And you kind of have to think laterally here. But what I like to do is to imagine, uh, which is kind of silly, that I'm like an alien uh, and I'm thinking about this category. What would someone from another planet say is different? Because that's going to help see kind of, it's like when you're a fish in water and you don't know the water that the water's there, what's gonna help you see that there's something that everyone just kind of assumes is normal for this category and you're gonna show that a different world is possible. So for example, if you're an alien, you'd be like, wow, like it doesn't matter if you're in you know, this continent or that continent, every hotel room kind of looks the same. Like, isn't that funny? Or all Swiss timepieces are expensive, rigid devices. All flip-flops are kind of flimsy and not really great for doing anything else except for a short walk. Once you've got that statement, then you get to the fun part, which is plotting. You get to show all your competitors, but instead of just being the combination of two things, you're essentially saying, yeah, all these guys are doing the same thing and we're doing something completely different. So you look at the Swiss swatch category, you know, and then you had swatch come in. Swatch is cheap. It's fun. It's flexible. It's not a rigid time, please. It's a flexible fashion accessory. Kenner are these really cool sandals from Brazil. They're not the typical flimsy flip-flop. They're kind of a flip-flop with like a sneaker sole and they're designed for dancing. An Airbnb isn't a room, but it's a local experience. And then the fifth step, you cannot forget it, is to actually operationalize. Um, you know, a brand strategy isn't anything until you actually bring it to life with the rest of your team. And so what you want to do here is map all your touch points, not just your communications, but your product, your employee customer service, and understand, okay, how do these all link to this new positioning that we're going to own? So for example, for Margaritaville, uh, they're a hotel, resort, casino, restaurant company. Their whole story is about owning, vacationing, island escapism. And so they launched this loyalty program a couple of years ago. And they were like, wait, we're a vacation brand. Why are we going to ask people to earn points? That's like a low paying part-time job. So they have a loyalty program that has no points. They just have rewards. As soon as you sign up, you get something, which I'm finding hilarious. And it fits their brand so well. And it's completely different to everyone else in the market. Or for example, with Crocs, you know, you go to the store and you can not just get a really weird pair of shoes, you can also customize it to be even weirder. And you can't really start to come up with these fun ideas until you have a clear idea of who you are. 
Um, all right, so that's the presentation. Uh, I see there's a ton of comments that I'm gonna see if there's any questions in the Q&A chat. Um, number one, will we receive a perceptual mat template slash slide deck? So I can share with you all, I have um, this whole deck is based off an article that I wrote um, on Medium. And so if you just go to the link at the bottom, you can uh, find that article as well as any other things about and by any other, I mean many, many articles about brand and marketing uh, and how to grow your business that way. Um, and then please put the link in the chat. You can just search it. It's right here. Um, let's see. And then if you could, because there's so many chats, put any questions in the Q&A um, because that's a bit easier for me to then see. Uh, let's see where I go in the chat. Um, any new challenger brands you are watching? Oh, that is a great question. Um, gosh, I feel like I'm always in the brand space. I've been really interested in brand turnarounds recently. Like I think, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on brands that are successful in their turnaround and brands that are not. And so I've been watching coach a lot because they've had this incredible turnaround as well as UGG has become kind of quote unquote cool again. Um, versus Burberry, there's a lot of research online about how they have kind of struggled to fully execute their redesign. They tried to go luxury, but they didn't, they kind of made a statement about going luxury, but they didn't support that kind of in step five with a cohesive positioning across their retail and products. When you say new brands, you know, I think a lot of people have been talking about liquid death in the soda space. Um, I saw this amazing quote about them online the other day that said, you know, they're a media company that just, you know, happens to sell water. And I found that fantastic. You know, they create ads that you want to watch and they're fun and interesting. And then they commercialize it with water. Are there any easy, simple tips for researching competitors? So some of the ways to research a competitor, you know, the cool thing about researching on marketing, as opposed to say, you know, working in supply chain management is that most things are public. So I can simply go on a company's Instagram. I can go on their website. Um, one of my favorite sites, if you go on Facebook and you can Google like the Facebook ad library, um, most companies happen to market on Facebook just because they have to, because it's one of the biggest channels. If you go on Facebook ad library, you can type in any brand and see all the ads that they're running on Facebook. It's a very simple way to understand, okay, these are the different messages they're putting out there and then quickly get a sense of what's working for them, what's not. And then, okay, once you have that all mapped out, it's then easy to say, how do I want to be different? Um, the question from Lisa was about researching competitors. For researching consumers, one of my favorite places is Reddit. Because it's anonymous, people happen to be very honest on Reddit, and you can get a lot of really interesting, honest feedback you wouldn't find anywhere else. Uh, what are some of the top innovative brand strategies you notice in the future that is going to cre crave more of? Um, oh gosh, that's a tough question because you know any brand strategy is going to be different, ideally on the market. Um, but, you know, I think so much of brand strategy has to do with rooting yourself in an underlying tension that is kind of frustrating or kind of bubbling up in culture today that maybe hasn't been fully um, at, like actionized by brands. I don't know if that's a full word, but I think you guys know what I mean. And so I would say look for tension and look for problems or things that people are talking about and feeling frustrated by or just or even excited about. So one thing that I notice is that um, in the in the fashion space, people keep talking about trends are happening so fast and everyone is just kind of looking the same. And so I think Crocs almost was super early to that by owning something about standing out. Something else is that, um, and I watched uh, a different talk this morning at 10 on the Medium Day chat by Nair Eyal, who wrote the book, Indistractable. Almost everybody I speak to tells me one of their goals this year is to use their phone less. And so if you're a brand and you can somehow come up with a way to own focus, to own living your life better, not being stuck on your phone, not being distracted, that could be a really interesting space that people would get excited about. 
Uh, the next question, if I'm building my own medium blog as my brand, how can I identify competitors within my domain? Any tools or tips, please? Um, gosh, I mean, I feel like my answers to this are fairly obvious. Um, I would look, I mean, I guess two things. I would look both at, you know, okay, what are people talking about within my area? But then I was like, wait, I would almost scratch that because specifically in the brand space, there's a lot of people who write about branding and I actually, I don't want to read their stuff, not because I'm not interested, because I actually am very interested, but because I don't want to have kind of the same content as everyone else. And that kind of really fits the, the whole theme of this talk. I would almost look at, okay, what is my point of view? But then who are some of the best writers out there? And what are they doing that makes me want to keep writing, you know, reading their content or watching their videos? With my content, you know, I think a lot of brand people tend to come from advertising. My background is a mix of both advertising and management consulting. And so I tend to bring a lot more like frameworks and a lot more business strategy and have a little bit less on the creative side. But then I try to make that my calling card and really talk about how does brand cascade across your whole business, not just the marketing department. And that's been a really good differentiator for me. And I also notice, you know, as I write, I think there's also the part of like seeing what works. Medium has amazing um, features on your stats. And I've noticed that the more I include frameworks and graphs, um, those articles tend to get more reads and people really like those. And so I've used those more over time. I would really see it as an experimental phase. You know, so much of marketing is saying, okay, is this going to work? You put it in the market, parts of it work, parts of it don't. And then you double down on the parts that are working. When starting an online business, should I write on Medium under my brand name or should I write under my real name? As a writer, passionate about many different topics, is a good idea to only keep my writing to the brand topics? Okay, so these are two different questions. On company versus real name, I think that really depends on your strategy. Do you want to brand yourself as a company or as a sole freelancer? You can do either. Um, that's really kind of a marketing decision. If you plan to say hire a team or scale your business, doing something under a company might do better in the long term. However, just from personal experience, I do notice that people tend to follow people quicker than they follow companies. And on like LinkedIn and other platforms, I think LinkedIn particularly, posts from companies tend to not get as much kind of fire in the algorithm as a post by an individual. And so if you're gonna be posting a lot of your work, say from Medium on LinkedIn to get more traction, it might also be better to do it through your own name. What I do is I have my blog is under my name, but I have a publication under my brand name. So whenever I post, um, I actually get both on there. I don't know if you're supposed to do that medium, but it's kind of a, a hack to get both names. Any resources you can suggest for growing a not-for-profit specifically? Um, so thanks, Al, for that question. I haven't actually worked in the not-for-profit space. I don't know enough about that business. But to be honest, I don't think that there would be that much difference from a brand. I think as a nonprofit, you probably have a lot more you can talk about in terms of your values as a company, which actually really lends it more to a brand driven strategy, as opposed to a company that isn't going to use their brand at all. And is mostly just about offering, say, the lowest priced and just going on Amazon and converting, which can be a great business. Um, but actually, I would just say for a nonprofit, like use your brand as much as you can because you have values or some sort of purpose is natural to your company. What do you see happening in the future for new brands to break the market uh, similar to what Airbnb did? Um, let's see, this is a tough question, but a good one. It's tough because I can't totally predict the future, um, but I do think, you know, the biggest thing for new brands is, you know, looking and understanding what's happening on the market. What are, as I said before, what are people talking about? What are they frustrated by? What are they excited by? What are people doing that they don't even realize they're kind of operating under with various assumptions and trying to craft a brand in that space? Um, obviously, that's a very generic answer, but without kind of a specific category, it's hard to know. Um, any tips for building for acting on brand identity as a company with a small marketing department or budget? That's a fantastic question and something I hear from many, many people. Um, in terms of acting on a small budget, the, the good thing about a small budget is it forces you to be super agile. 
some of the lower priced channels that people are using are really um, influencers. And you actually see this across the board. So like Abercrombie executed one of the greatest rebrands of all time earlier this than the past few years. And to gain traction and credibility, they largely executed it through influencers. So an influencer doesn't necessarily just need to be someone on Instagram. It can be someone on TikTok. It could be someone on LinkedIn. Um, it could be someone in sports. It could be, you know, I'm looking to influence doctors. I'm looking to influence people at the coffee shop. One thing Oatly did was they realized their influencer was baristas. And so they developed a specific version of Oatly specific for baristas. And they started getting their product into small coffee shops for free because if their oat milk is what the barista is using, then to a regular customer, you're like, oh, wait, this tastes great in my coffee. I don't need to use soy milk or cow milk. And that was a really strong strategy for them. I would say thinking about, okay, who is kind of influencing the art, the audience that I want and how do I influence the influencer? Do you brand your medium work outside of medium? Uh, yes and no. I have my own website um, that my medium links to. I also use LinkedIn. I use Twitter. I use Instagram. Medium is fantastic because they'll circulate really good articles within their network, but then you're only targeting kind of the medium community who's fantastic. And they're all here. Um, but there's also a ton of people outside of medium. And I would say as much as you can, you know, don't be shy about putting your stuff out there. When I started doing that, I definitely felt a bit cringe, like sharing stuff. I feel like especially on LinkedIn is can feel uncomfortable, but I realized that actually people like hearing, especially from their friends and family, like what they're up to and seeing things. And people tend to be really supportive. Um, I think people hate on LinkedIn a lot. LinkedIn is an incredibly supportive platform. People rarely troll. There's a bit of trolling on Twitter, um, but I would say feel comfortable like sharing on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to, you know, post on LinkedIn and email me. I'm happy to like your post. So it'll start to get some traction. Um, let's see. And there's a couple other questions in the chat chat. Do you agree that people tend to buy benefits and outcomes rather than features? Um, I would say yes and no. You know, I think um, if you guys aren't aware, like there's this framework called benef sell a benefit, not a feature. Um, so instead of saying, you know, this car is really fast, which is a benefit, you'd say this car is going to get you you know, you're going to be able to do more in the day. And that's the benefit. Um, I think both can kind of work. You know, I think benefits tend to be a bit more higher level and tend to root them closer to where you are as a customer. And so people tend to say that. However, I have seen features sell really well. So I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule. I think you have to be very clinical about this and say, okay, again, who's in the market? What are my competitors offering? Because if every competitor is selling the same benefit and then you phrase it as a feature, you might actually stand out better. Um, any recommendations to keep up with multiple platforms, keeping your brand consistent and secured? Uh, I would just start with, uh, well, first, that's also a very good question because I think um, I have gotten the question about brand consistency from almost every client. And it's funny because you would think that a company would be super consistent. But what actually happens is companies start to grow, new people join, everyone's kind of operating in different areas and also trying to do stuff as fast as possible. So as much as you can at some point, usually not at the very beginning, but as you start to scale, develop almost very simple brand guidelines. What is our kind of boilerplate copy around, you know, how do we describe ourselves? What's our logo? What's our tagline? Having those things very basic and also just a little bit focused you know, don't just say, oh, I am a brand consultancy because everyone's going to say that I am a brand consultancy that blends creative with business or that is really focused on innovative packaging is actually going to help people remember you more. Um, what are some unconventional ways to build awareness without the need to cap to tap into what's trending? Right, this last question, because uh, I know we're out of time. Um, trending is something that I think brands tend to accidentally fall into because of social media. And I would actually say, avoid that if you can, because what happens is you end up chasing what people are talking about. And if you do that too much, you don't end up having a clear identity for what you stand for, but rather just taking on this shapeshifter chameleon identity where you don't actually have a clear, um, thing that you stand for. So I'd actually 
kind of follow the steps in this and define who you are first and then use that as a lens to what's trending as opposed to being led by that. I um, hope that was helpful for you all. Please attend more sessions. There's a lot of really smart people in Medium uh, today. Um, and yeah, hope you have a great rest of your day.